Ladies, gentlemen, and all those other, welcome back to another episode of the Violin Building Series. It's Eric Trimber back here. Sorry for the lengthy delay between the last video and this one. I have been busy. Speaking of busy, off camera here, I have drilled many holes in these plates. We are getting ready to thickness them, to hollow out this underside here. Now, what I've done is these holes are not all drilled down the same amount. They are drilled so that they are the same distance from the front of the plate, meaning that if I carve away all the material, leaving none of the holes left, I should have roughly consistent thickness to work from. In this case, it's about four millimeters. On the back plate, it's variable. It's thicker in the center, um, skinnier towards the bottom and top bouts. Now, I'm taking my one-inch gouge, and I'm going at this. Unfortunately, I'm not going at it quite enough. I'm very terrified of this. Um, certainly, I'm not showing that on camera here. But I struggled so much to take away enough material just because I was too afraid to go too far. And it really wasted a lot of time. This probably took three, four times as long as it should have had I just gone down to the proper depth with the gouge the first time. I'd bring it down with the gouge, start with the finger plane, go back to the gouge, finger plane again and that wasn't enough obviously and I just kept going back and back to the gouge now that being said it all turns out all right in the end you can see me trying with the finger plane here I end up switching to a different one because this is really not working too well this larger one now what thickness are we going towards is it just a common thickness now it might be tempting to say that and there are people who certainly just go off of thickness maps uh somewhat variable but mostly round about the same especially for the uh, belly plate here but no we are going to be doing a technique called plate tuning now these plates vibrate at specific frequencies um de it depends not just on like one single fundamental but they vibrate in different ways different modes and we can measure those we need relationships between the modes in a single plate relationship across modes in the front and back plate and there's also a pattern in which it vibrates we'll see that visualized here in a moment we also want the weight to be something specific okay this is what i'm talking about 358 hertz watch this tea leaves boom this is our mode five isn't that crazy this is just a speaker underneath there for those wondering this is a good pattern this is called a cladney pattern we'll do the same for the back plate I'll measure the modes using a different technique, and I'll check for the patterns later, but for right now, I just want the relationships to be roughly the same. They're going to change here, because I still have to do, look at this, the F-holes. This is a piece of plastic here, and you might be wondering how I got this shape in there, and that's because I have a 3D printer, and this is a single-layer 3D print. you got to print this type of thing on a glass bed, otherwise it'll never stick down, you'll never have a consistent thickness. The glass is dead flat, so you know that you can level your machine out to do this. You might be able to laser cut this, um, but with a plastic so thin, uh, I think it would be very difficult to not melt more than you intend. You can see I did some measurements there just to make sure it's in the right place, and I have those holes in the center to also help me line it up along the center line. I'll trace out the pattern, and holy crap, you know we haven't cut them out yet, but... I think that's looking pretty nice. So, how are we going to cut those out? Oh, actually, before we cut them out, we have to do this uh, fluting here. So, all this is is a decorative cut, relief cut, on the bottom part of this wing here. I don't think it's super noticeable, but it's standard, it's common, I was going to do it. Maybe I didn't go far enough. I do think it makes it flow a little bit nicer but it doesn't make an acoustic difference. It's just they're purely decorative. So I've chosen a couple of drill bits that are just undersized of the holes we are aiming for. And what I'm going to do is, because I don't have a, one of those crank drills, I know they have a specific name. It just escapes me at this point in time. I'm going to twist this bit by hand. So you saw me drilling it backwards there a moment ago, and now I'm going to go forwards. I drilled it backwards just to score the... Um, surface of the fibers and make sure that I don't chip out the wood when I go in uh, fully here. So I'm going to keep drilling down until I poke out the other side and I constantly check for that and it's hard to tell but there was a little hole there, this is a Brad Point bit so that 
tip, the very tip pokes through, but not the rest of it. So I flip it around, I score the other side, and then I finish drilling out from the front here. Um, and that's all to ensure I don't chip out the wood. That being said, um, it didn't really drill it out so much because of how I'm just turning it in my hand. It more broke out, still leaving clean lines where it broke, but where it didn't, I had to go in with the knife there. Uh, but you can see one hole. And I'll do that for the other four as well. Uh, it's a different hole for the top. Um, but then I'll go in with a coping saw. And man, this is where uh, one of my more regrettable mistakes on this violin comes in. I should not, I knew, I knew at the time that it was too aggressive of a blade, but I thought it would be fine. And I mean, for the most part, it was. But right at the bottom of those wings, there's like very little clearance. It's like the curve of the blade is pretty much all you have. And with this thick blade, it just chips out the bottom. It In the center, it's fine because you're going to cut that away. But on those wing tips, it's going to chip out. And then well, you can't put the wood back. Certainly can't glue those tiny pieces back. They're gone. Uh, they don't stick on. And so the same thing happens right here, this spot that I'm going through right now. It's not noticeable on the final instrument. I did finish it, by the way. I'll be trying to get out all the videos for that soon. But, um, yeah, that is just very upsetting for me to have done that. You can see me going in here with the knife widening those out. So, yeah, I, I didn't um, stay close to the lines in the center. I was right in the middle of it, and I simply am using my knife now to open that out. And this is just a lot of tedious work. I'm just using my X-Acto knife. Um, I have some other carving knives, but the X-Acto knife is very thin, and that's what you need in this situation, and also very sharp. So I switch my blades out frequently, um, being sure to go with the direction of the grain always. Uh, and I'll also use my small files here, here, my needle files, to neaten that out. So you can see those are pretty much done there. We'll get a better shot of it later. But right now, this is our priority, the base bar. So we've cut out those F-holes, and that's slightly weakened the structural integrity. It's actually changed those modes we worked on before. But we will bring that back up using the base bar. Base bar also adds structural support, and it also kind of acts as a spring. Uh, but again, that it, it's mostly because you need to restore the same integrity it had before the F-holes. So uh, it has a specific marking. It is angled. It's not straight across. That's the angle it needs to be at. I will mark that with a pencil. So I make sure I put it back in the same spot every time. You can see how close it is to the F hole there. Um, <laughs> I included this because I've seen a lot of guys on YouTube do this to mark their base bars. And so they, they roll this washer along and they put a pencil in and they make it look so easy. And I don't know what sorcery, what devilish sorcery they are using because holy crap this is difficult <laughs> i can't balance the washer i don't know what they're doing like, this is the best shot i was able to get of me doing that the rest of it was just an absolute disaster but you can see we have a rough shape of this so this is getting glued in and it has to perfectly match that inside contour that we've curved and it's curved in, in every direction so it takes a little bit of carving, um, but we can get it roughed in. This still isn't good enough for gluing, though. And so I'll put this chalk on it. Ah, here's another mistake, guys. This chalk, it's a marking chalk. It's meant to go on, no, oh, I forget the name of it. You, you know, it's a string. You put it on the string, you, you flick it up, and it makes a line in the ground with the chalk. This is a terrible, 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 terrible idea. Uh, this chalk is so fine it like embeds itself it like penetrates the wood like i'm baffled like you could use it as a stain anyways how we're using it we, we rub the base bar on it we see the high spots and i file those down um sorry just bumped you guys there once i do that i know it's a perfect fit once i see a very nice line of chalk it is not flat along the top though so now that i have it fitting correctly i'll measure certain heights up from that bottom and I will m roughly mark out where we are going to carve this to. Now, I'm not going to carve it before I glue it because I, it's nice to have the flat surface to clamp to. So I'm just going to mark it out now when it's easy, and I will carve it down later. And this is meant to be a rough guide, but let me tell you, it turns out spot on. So you can start to see that shape we're going for there. Thicken the center, tapers out towards the end. 
I'll get some nice uh, hide glue on this. Now, I, at many points in the process, um, the resources I was saying said, oh, you want to mix up a new batch of hide glue? I can't mix up a new batch of hide glue like every time I go on to a new step. It's the same glue the whole way through. I, maybe that. Maybe I'll regret that later, but I think it, it will hold up just fine. This is 300 gram strength. You'll see I'll hold it in place roughly, and again, I have... I. Don't, I know it's not clear, but I do have um, some pencil marks, and I'll clamp it into place. Now, some people have um, these cleats they'll put in, which perfectly match it up. And yeah, while that certainly would get you better alignment, um, I really don't think that it makes that much of a difference. Now, I only got four clamps on here. Really should have more, but it's such a tight fit. I mean, that chalk fitting really gets you, if you take your time with it, gets you a perfect fit. So I feel confident in this glue up. What I'll do now is I will shave it down. I don't know why I'm using the chisel like this. Doesn't matter. I get it down and I'll finish it up with some sandpaper. There is one more thing is that we are going to taper down these ends. Uh, I don't know what the angle is, but it's a little le it's a little shallower than 45 and we'll take it down. Again, why am I, why am I using the chisel like this? Who knows? Who, who freaking knows? I think I, I changed at the end. I, I, I wise enough. I say, w what am I doing? Yeah, there we go. So you'll see that I, I'm just taking tiny little shavings off of it. I don't want to nick the inside surface of the plate. Not that a small nick like that will really matter. Uh, but as you can see, I take that down and then I'll chamfer the edges as well using my little um, thumb plane. I really like this plane. I, oh, it's so nice and it's so cute as well. It's absolutely adorable. And you can see the final plate here, um, pretty much done at this point. And you can see the nice taper. It still needs cleaned up on the inside. And here's the cladney pattern again. You'll see it's a little less curved on the top. I think that's fine. Um, I didn't change it, so it better be fine. But look at the back. This is supposed to look the same with that curve at the top, but there's two vertical lines. I know this kind of sounds like uh, palm reading, but no, trust me, that's bad. I thin out the top. I do it again. It looks better. This is it. Look at that. Mm, that's what we're going for. So I just thinned it out. I try to change the modes as little as possible. They did change. The relationship, by the way, if you're curious, is a semitone apart. I had it a semitone below the back. The back plate is a semitone below the front plate. People say different things. Some people say you want them exactly on top of each other. Other people say semitone above. Some people say semitone below. I did a semitone below just because that's what I was closest to. You can also see here, I rounded the corners or the edges. Really helps the look of the violin a lot. Um, it also does change the modes a little bit, but not the modes that we're most concerned about. I think this is mostly a mode one. And look at this. This is what the plate looks like. F-holes carved, base bar installed, edging done. <laughs> Man, I, I'm looking at this now. It looks so nice. I'm very pleased. The F-holes are not perfect. I know that. Um, probably the biggest area of improvement. Uh, back plate, though, looks really nice. A word on the F-holes... Uh, some people do like these really sharp, crisp edge F holes, and I honestly don't like that. Um, but mine aren't even like just soft. They're like messed up. Anyways, beside the point, now that we're this far, we don't really have anything else to do to these plates other than glue them on the ribs. But that will have to wait not until next episode, but the episode after, because next episode we will be carving the scroll and the neck of the instrument. And that'll be very interesting. Again, sorry for the delay in this episode. Hopefully, I'll be able to get more out soon here. But, you know, it's been a pleasure to have you guys. I'm really glad that some people are still enjoying and watching these videos. Please subscribe for the next one. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.